The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Good to have you all out there listening to the Paul Leslie Hour. Welcome to it. This time around, I'm honored to speak to someone I have wanted to interview for years now. Roger Murrah is a veteran songwriter who has written so many songs known and loved by people for decades. He's been writing since his youth. Some of the songs he wrote, and there are so many, I'm just going to name a few, Don't Rock the Jukebox, which Alan Jackson recorded. I'm in a hurry and don't know why, recorded by the band Alabama. We're in this love together, which I think has become a pop standard, recorded by the late Al Jarreau. Some of the other artists who have recorded his work would include Conway Twitty, Steve Warner, Barbara Mandrell, Kenny Rogers, Winona, Ronnie Millsap, Clay Walker. There are so many. Roger Murrah has received awards from BMI and the CMA. In 2005, he was inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. Mr. Murrah, thank you very much for making the time to speak with us. Oh, thank you, Paul. It's my pleasure. I appreciate you inviting me. It's an honor. Thank you, sir. So, like many great songwriters and musicians in our history as Americans, you come from the state of Alabama. Yeah, I sure do. I was raised in Athens, Alabama. And maybe you could paint a picture with words. What was the typical day like in Athens, Alabama, growing up? Well, it was, uh, I kind of belonged to a um, lower middle class, I suppose you would say financially, family who lived on a farm. And we, uh, a typical day was taking care of things on the farm and uh, going to school. And have, I, I came from a large family, so we had a lot of family activity. And it was kind of a typical day like everybody else has, I suppose. (laughs) But uh, it was a very good good place to grow up. A lot of good people in that area. And uh, I've been in Nashville since 1972. I came up here to uh, pursue the music business. and um, But I get back to Athens and Alabama uh, pretty regularly. What was the first instrument that you learned to play? Well, my dad traded a pickup truck for an old acoustic piano. And uh, me and a couple of other siblings learned how to play that piano by ear. And I always, the best I ever learned was just how to play chords, which has been very uh, helpful to songwriting because it kept my melodies simple and uh so i i didn't know i I've, I've said before in uh on occasions that it's it's amazing how much my lack of knowledge of music has helped me be a songwriter because i didn't know how to overdo it <laughs> <laughs> so i kept it simple but uh it was that acoustic piano that came on and and we still have that piano and uh it's in storage down in Athens. Fascinating. So when you started to write songs, was it were you writing lyrics first? Were you tinkering around on the piano, coming up with little melodies? How did that come to be? Well, it kind of came together at once. You know, I would I would just start humming to my playing the piano and just messing around on the piano. And um uh, for a period of time, the lyrics made no sense at all. I just kind of just mouthed things where I could sing and kind of put my heart into the music. And I think it was a real good way to learn how to get acquainted with melody. And um, and then later on, it, it kind of dawned on me that these lyrics are going to have to make sense to do any good, <laughs> to do anybody else any good. So I started to paying attention and uh and gradually through the years you know got got better at it thankful i'm thankful to say and um 
So I'm I'm one of those that call themselves self-taught because I I really kind of did it in the back room of the family home there in in Athens on the farm, just playing and and kind of entertaining myself. <laughs> And what kind of music were you into at that point? Who were your favorite artists or bands? My my early influence was totally rhythm and blues, R&B. And uh, there were a lot of great things happening over in Muscle Shows, a few cotton fields across the way from Athens. All kinds of people were recording there, Aretha Franklin, Percy Sledge, and uh, the list goes on and on. It, they had, they even had the uh, Rolling Stones came there to record. And they said, people used to say, why, why is so much music coming out of Muscle Shows? And the people there said, we have nothing else to do. <laughs> so <laughs> there was uh, some great music coming out of Muscle Shows. But I was, I was really influenced by R&B artists. Of course, everybody's influenced by Ray Charles, uh, but I loved, um, I just loved all the popular artists back in those days and um, didn't really pay a lot of attention to country at that time. It it seemed more like adult music for me. And um, But after I moved to Nashville, I incorporated my R&B background with the country genre and uh come to find out that is exactly where i belonged and and i have just loved country music from the from the get-go i mean i but i've I've been able to use the early influences from r&b in my melodies and so it's kind of like the best of both worlds but uh but i i do belong in country music and uh I realized that for a number of years, and I appreciate the history of it and the uh, all the background of country. I just I just love it. Those that came before me. Who out there in country music, as far as the writers, would you say, when you did start getting into country music, who did you appreciate? I especially appreciated Mickey Newberry. Now, for those who haven't heard of Mickey, I I would uh, s- recommend that you look him up. His songs were just amazing. And um, I enjoyed Curly Putman's work. Curly was also from Alabama. He wrote Green Green Grass of Home. And um, I remember talking to Curly years ago. And I told him all the rest of us from Alabama were just little, little Curly's trying to get started, you know, <laughs> and, uh, he was good to help us. And, uh, but I, I enjoyed his work. I've always been, I guess if I had to choose one, it would be Paul Simon. I loved his work. I think he's one of the best songwriters we've had. And, uh, but you know, I loved a lot of it. I, I appreciate the Beatles more every year. I just, I just love the Beatles and they've, They've taken us on an amazing journey with their music. And I had the privilege as chairman of the Songwriter Foundation to give an honorary award to Paul McCartney several years ago. And I got to meet Paul, and he was he was just the nice guy you expect him to be. And uh, But what a talent. My, my influences come from all over the map. I mean, some country writers, some... Uh, R&B writers like Dan Penn, Spooner Oldham. They were two white guys that were writing all that music that black artists were having uh, huge hits with down in Muscle Shoals. And uh, I ended up being considered a contemporary of theirs, which was unbelievable to me because they were always my idols as as songwriters. But uh, there have been some amazing songwriters through the years. Uh, Bobby Braddock, as soon as I get off this interview, I'll think of 14 different writers, <laughs> but right now I'm pulling blanks. <laughs> There's one artist that has had a part in your story that has had 
a part in so many writers and musicians. And I'm talking about Bobby Bear. Tell us about meeting him yeah. and, and what effect he's had on your life. Well, you know, we used to have a recording studio in Huntsville, Alabama, me and uh, uh, three other partners, I believe it was. And Bobby brought his wife, Jenny, down there to record years ago. So that was my first opportunity to meet Bobby. And then as years went on, the um, the recording studio wasn't doing very well. It, I mean, being out of a music center and, and uh, a lot of different reasons, a lot of us involved in, with it weren't very mature with our talent and things like that. But anyhow, I did get to meet Bobby. And so years pass, and then I ended up going up to see Bobby in Nashville to try to book him for a JC County fair in my hometown of Athens. And so while I was up there to talk to him about that, he, uh, he asked me what I was doing. And I said, I said, well, I'm kind of between things right now. And what that meant was I wasn't doing anything. <laughs> I didn't have a job or anything. And he said, have you, do you have any of your songs with you? And I said, well, I have one song out in the car. It was called Send Tomorrow to the Moon. And it was kind of a pop song. I said, well, I don't know if you like it, Bobby, but it's kind of a pop song. And he said, well, let me listen to it. So he, uh, I went out and got it and brought it in and played it for him. He really liked it and uh, ended up, by the way, recording it himself. But uh, from that song and that meeting, Bobby asked me if I'd like to come up and uh, write for his company, Return Music. And I said, I sure would. So he gave me a $50 a week draw and um, helped me move up. And that's where it all began in Nashville. He, and, uh, and speaking of Bobby, you're absolutely right. He, Bobby kind of had golden ears in those days. I mean, he had the best best uh, knowledge of songs and, and the instinct about st songs about as good or better than anybody I've ever met. And at that time, Billy Joe Schaefer was writing for his company. And Bobby, of course, was, was recording early Billy Joe stuff. And Bobby was the first to record Tom T. Hall, Chris Christopherson, and I could just go on and on. Uh, he he just had a sense about him about songs. He loved good songs. And then he and Shel Silverstein had a long run together. They were kind of like brothers. And uh, so, yeah, Bobby's been involved in a lot of careers. And he certainly was very instrumental in mine. We owe him a lot. <laughs> and a fascinating character he is. <laughs> yes, yes. He was. He, he loved fish. He and Porter Wagner and little Jimmy Dickens and those guys. They used to Mel Tillis. There are all kind of stories about those guys fishing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Bobby. He, he was uh, very special to Nashville. I tell you. Who was the very first person to record a Roger Murrah song? Well, it was actually a guy named Bobby Harden. Years ago, there was a Harden trio. It was Bobby and two sisters. And Bobby recorded a song of mine. And um, this is going to be kind of comical, but the, the title of the song was Just Because He Loved Her Before I Loved Her Don't Mean She'll Love Him Again. And uh, Bobby said to me, he said, do you think we could shorten that title? Of course, we did that, <laughs> and uh, it, it became um, just because he loved her. And I don't know, I don't know if it ever hit the charts or not, but it was my first professional recording, and it meant a lot to me. But uh, that was the one. That was the one. What did that feel like when there it is? There's a recording artist, and they have cut your song. Well, 
you know, at that stage of my career, it 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 gave me a lot of validation and probably more validation than I actually deserved. <laughs> but uh but it, it it was pretty amazing, it really was. I mean, it's hard to imagine. And then then as time went on I started getting recordings on other people and uh some were just very, very special cuts. Some this is not unique to me, but all writers experience disappointment with the way some of their songs are recorded. And uh, many people will tell you that the demos were better than the masters. And uh, But that's just kind of part of the way of life and the music as a songwriter. But that doesn't didn't mean you didn't appreciate it 100%. You just kind of heard the song a little differently, you know, and uh, but I've had a lot of a lot of good people record our songs through the years, and I've uh, the one thing I've ended up with more than anything is gratitude. I just have so much gratitude to all the people that have helped me, and for the industry in itself is has been good to me. Nashville has been good to me, and uh, we worked hard and. Uh, I don't regret a day of it. It was just, uh, I've been very, very fortunate, very blessed all the way, really. But there, you know, there were, um, there were hard times. There were years of struggling, but uh, it just made us, it makes you appreciate the good, good times. You can't appreciate the good times as much if you don't have some hard times. And that's the way life is. Yeah. Well, this morning, I was listening to the Wynn Stewart, your first, this was your first mm. chart hit, wasn't it? It's raining in Seattle? Yes. Yes, it was. It sure was. And uh, I'll tell you something interesting about that song. I had no idea that Seattle had so much rain. I just didn't know enough about geography to know that. So it was kind of ironic that I wrote about Seattle, but it was... Uh, but I was just using the the name Seattle because I thought it sounded melodic for what I was doing, and um, and Wynn Stewart, he he was one of Texas' best song uh, singers. He he just really was a singer, and uh, Bobby Bear was producing him at the time, so obviously I had an in with Bobby producing him, and then. Um, Jerry Bradley, who was heading up RCA Records at the time, he tried to get in touch with Wynn. They were going to do some promotion or something. And Wynn, he kind of had some bad times in his life where he dealt with alcohol. And so, long story short, Wynn didn't return Jerry's calls. So Jerry ended up dropping him from the label. And it just so happened we had the song that they dropped him on. So we could have, we could have very possibly had a much better hit if Wynn had to come and, and return the call. <laughs> you know, so, but, but yet it, it's a record that meant a lot to me because it was first charted record. And I love the way he did it, by the way. I love the way he sang it. It's a great recording. That's for sure. Yeah. It, it really is. I mean, he he just he is just a heck of a singer. You yeah. You were mentioning. You said there have been highs and there have been lows. There were t- there were tough mm-hmm. times too. What kept sure. you going? Well, you know, it, it would be. Uh, it could be as simple as somebody recording a song and putting it on a B side back when they had A's and B sides, something like that. You could you could get months of uh, of um, validation from, so it just it didn't take much to to keep you keep you going. I mean, uh, it would be uh, little little things would happen along the way that that encourage you, and uh, even in the darkest times, I mean, there were 
somebody might say they liked your song and you may find out that somebody very important liked your song and and those comments that people would would make it just kept you thinking well maybe maybe i can make it maybe i can make this work you know and um of course no one does it alone i've had a Many people help me, and that's just the way it is. That's we all. It, it works like that, and um, so I've had a lot of encouragement from people back when uh, back when more activity was the desire, but I just had to wait on it. And uh, with uh, the music business, it's a lot about timing, and it happens at the most unbelievable times sometimes i mean it's just it's just kind of freaky how things go but you can be rocking along in a dark period and all of a sudden have a major hit come out and change your world and um so that started happening later on in in my career and so uh, once you've done it you feel kind of like you can do it again and then um it's kind of like going through dry spells as a writer. You, I mean, my first dry spell or two, I thought, man, alive, I'll never write another song. And then then you find out, you just get your mind off of it, and before you know it, you're back at it. So that was encouraging, too. <laughs> just a while ago, you were saying sometimes you hear the song and you think, the demo sounded better or mm -hmm. goodness, I wouldn't have done mm -hmm. it that way. But on the flip mm -hmm. side, who would you say recorded a Roger Murrah song? You heard the song that they recorded and you thought, wow, they have knocked this clear out of the park. Yeah. I'll tell you exactly who comes to mind. Okay. Travis Tritt. If there's anybody in town that can over sing a song, Travis could, because he, he was just that talented. And when I found out he had recorded where Corn Oak Grove, I thought, oh boy, I hope he didn't overdo it. And when I heard it, I mean, it just could not have been done better than Travis. I just loved it, absolutely loved it. And it's not the only one that I've loved, and it wouldn't have mattered to me, even if you know, you want them all to be hits, but even if that that had been had not been hit, it would have still been very pleasing to me because it was recorded so well. Travis just knocked it out of the park for sure, and he could have easily oversung that song. And uh, but uh, he knew he knew what to do with it. And uh, another one of my favorite recordings, the best music track that I recall ever having was a song that Bob McDill and I wrote called uh, Somebody Slap Me. <laughs> it was recorded by, uh, oh, shucks, what's his name? Oh, Chuck Cole, what's his name? The John hmm. Anderson version? Yeah, John Anderson. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I love John Anderson. He could he could sing the, the, the uh, preamble of the Constitution, and it would would be incredible. <laughs> but uh, that music track, if you get a chance, listen to that thing. Keith Stegall produced it. And I love the way John sang it. And somebody just totally misunderstood that song and thought it was bashing women. And, it, and it's doing everything but that. I mean, it's, it all, it's all about building up that girl that this guy had the perfect girl, really. <laughs> and, uh, he wanted somebody to slap him because he was uh, he was just so um, blown away with the kind of girl she was, you know. And um, but somebody took offense to that, and, and it just started falling off the charts around the country. But it was on its way. I think it would have been a big, big record if, if somebody hadn't misunderstood it. But anyhow, it's the the recording of it is still one of the best of. I've ever had. You mentioning John Anderson, it makes me remember an interview that I did years ago in Gainesville, Georgia, with the songwriter Bruce Birch. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah uh, Bruce, my buddy. Yeah. He says hello, by the way. I told him. Well, good, good. <laughs> Bruce is a good guy. Absolutely. He told me this story about about you, and he said that he was a waiter. And I remember mm -hmm. he said that he would always keep your, your iced tea glass full. <laughs> because he, yeah. I'm hoping you can tell us a, a, a little bit about about what you thought when you met this character, Bruce Birch. Well, number one, he he was taking care of business as a waiter. He worked at Houston's over on West End. By the way, I miss Houston's. It's not here anymore. But I think it used to be in Atlanta as well. But but Bruce was a waiter there, and he was in. I think he may have been in college as well, and. And he was pursuing music, and uh, he was just the nicest guy in the world. And uh, he's, you know, he's one of those people that you want to do something for them, you know, uh, if you get a chance. And so, so we became uh, friends just because we met there. Him waiting on me and whoever I was with at the uh, restaurant, and um, yeah, and, and Bruce, I tell you one thing. One thing that you have to be good at in the music business, and I think in any kind of business, Bruce was a professional networker. He knew how to network. <laughs> and uh, I, I probably learned some tricks from him myself. But uh, but he, he, yeah, he was, uh, he, he, we ended up writing a song together, and he became a kind of a sidekick to Guy Clark, the greatest, one of the greatest stuff. Uh, Texas poets, songwriters, and uh, Bruce was well respected in town. As time went on, he he really got around. A lot of people knew him, and uh, he just he just knew how to treat people and didn't make mistakes with relationships. And so he, he could teach all of us a lot of tricks, really. But he became a good songwriter and. Uh, was just a. Uh, I think he ended up doing some teaching down in Georgia. I think at yes. the college down there, absolutely in the music department. Yeah, and uh, he's just just a fine man, fine man, good guy. Absolutely, and I've never met a human being who doesn't know him. <laughs> well, I I believe that now. I believe that. See, it's, so I rest my case. He's a networker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he knows how to get around. There is one song that you wrote in particular that it's a, it's just it's a fantastic song and you hear it you could be at the drugstore you could be pumping your gas you could be at the mall and I'm talking of course about we're in this love together Yes thank you thank you I I tell you what thinking talking about hearing it I actually was in the Eiffel Tower in Paris after that happened, and I was riding up in the elevator, you know. And and back in those days, they had a, a, a music service called uh, Muzak, and that's where they piped music into all these uh, businesses and things like that. Well, anyhow, I was going up, and all of a sudden, Al comes on singing our song, We're in This Love Together. And I'm standing in the Eiffel Tower, and I'm thinking, man, this is a long way from Athens, Alabama. I said, I've got, I got this song, and I hadn't got anybody to tell them. Tell. <laughs> I didn't know anybody else on the on the elevator at the time. But that that was one of the special times I've heard one of my songs. And uh, but that song uh, is has been quite a quite a um, phenomenon really it all started when i was we had a we were working at, at april blackwood which later become became cbs songs we were on music row and i was i always got in early i just like to start early i guess it's being from the farm i don't know but then keith stigall came in one morning and uh so I asked Keith, I said, Keith, what do you think about this title? And he said, what's that? I said, we're in this love together. And he said, uh, well, it, it doesn't sound like a country song. 
title. And, um, of course, I wasn't even thinking about it necessarily for country. But anyhow, he sat down and started a riff on the guitar that ended up surviving the master cut. That riff has lived with the song as part of the song. And Keith and I wrote that song in one day, in couple, probably a couple of three hours, and there was one line missing. So on my way to um, home that afternoon, I passed the Brentwood exit. And I remember, there's many, many, many things I can't remember, but I always remember. I wrote the line, like berries on a vine, it gets sweeter all the time at that Brentwood exit. And that finished our song for that day. <laughs> so <laughs> so we ended up with it, finished it, that, that one setting, really. But uh, later on, it was uh, just quickly uh, a young man by the name of Ed Thomas was pitching songs for, for April Blackwood in those days. And he sent a cassette out to Warner Brothers, and that was uh, Al Jarreau's label. And I really don't know to this day if he sent it specifically to Al or if he just sent it to the A&R department. But um, as time went on, we get a call, and they said that Al Jarreau loved the song. He was listening to songs, cassettes, last night, and he he saved one of them out of the whole box of stuff he had. And it was We're in the Slug Together. Of course, I didn't know who Al Jarreau was at the time. He... His background was primarily jazz. So I go down to the record store and buy an album of his called This Time. And I played that album and I came back and told everybody, I said, I don't know what he's going to do to it, but it's going to be great. <laughs> he really did. It was, it was, as they say sometimes, a match made in heaven. He He was meant for that song and that song was meant for him. And he was... He's always was always very grateful to us for that. And uh, of course, Al's uh, deceased now, but I went up to do a, a documentary on his career and met his oldest sister. She lives in Canada. And I got the greatest compliment from her. She said, we want to thank you for taking our brother to the pop radio station because at that time he wasn't getting played on pop radio. He was strictly jazz. And uh, so it was great for Al. It was great for us as well. It's it just good in any way you look at it. <laughs> and a lot of people have loved it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm hoping you can tell us about the album that you collaborated with Wayland Jennings on. A Man Called Haas that came out in the late 80s. Yeah. Yes. Well, i tell you, Waylon, I've met a few famous uh, singers through the years and famous people. But Waylon, I have to say, he remained bigger than life even after I got to know him. He was, he could be like a kid one day or he could be like a, he could be mean and ornery, as his songs would say. <laughs> but he he was a wonderful, wonderful man. He had a great sense of humor. And he was talented beyond his, uh, just beyond himself, because uh, what he, he did things accidentally sometimes that were, were just masterful. Uh, what we would do, we would, first of all, he called me before the end of one year. And um, he said, I'd like to talk to you. I'm thinking about writing an album about my life. And I've been listening to some of your songs. And at that time, he had recorded maybe a couple of my songs. But he loved the way I phrased songs. And uh, so I went down to his office to meet with him. And, uh, and it was just, uh, it was kind of like, I don't know, just it's like sitting with the Wizard of Oz a little bit, you know. <laughs> but he was 
wasn't behind the curtain. He was right there on the on the couch. But uh, so we we talked about it, and uh, my uh, I told he, he told me to think about it. I said I had I had a reservation or two about it, and I'd want to talk to him about it. So he said, "Well, just go go ahead, and after the holidays, meaning the first of that next year." he would call me and we'd get back together. So I was kind of wondering if he'd ever call again. And of course he did exactly what he said he'd do, which Waylon was good at that. He was a man of his word. And uh, so I went back down and talked to him and, and I was a little concerned about how he would want to deal with the drug days in, in this album because uh being a Christian, there were things about it that I wouldn't want to write. And, uh, and he made me a promise that he kept a hundred percent. He said, he said, I'll tell you what, Hoss, if you and I aren't both happy with what we do, we won't include it. So he, he basically promised me, you know, we'll, we'll do it in a way that, that you're comfortable with it and that I'm comfortable with it, you know? And, and then we, go on to when it happened I had a little small office at Tom Collins Music and uh, first of all let me tell you a little funny thing about Tom Tom one of the best businessmen that ever hit the streets of Nashville he was a great publisher and producer and um, so anyhow he knew about my my uh, reluctance about the drug thing and uh, so Tom tells me We'll work it out, man. Don't worry. We'll work it out. <laughs> he was all about making the money, you know. So he taught me a lot about business. Or anything, but that was kind of funny. But anyhow, time goes on. And and I've got this real small office at Tom Collins. And, and Wayland would come there. He'd park his, uh, what he called the golden nose. It was a gold Eldorado. He'd park it out in front of the office every morning. And he'd come in and we'd drink coffee. And first thing he'd want to do is he'd say, who's going to go get the Brown's burgers. Now, for those who don't know what Brown's burgers are, it's just a little greasy, but great hamburger place here in Nashville. <laughs> that's been here forever. And Waylon, Waylon, we, we, we picked up some one day and it became a habit. He had to have them every morning. So, <laughs> Um, so he'd want to know who's going to get the Browns burgers. And then, and then he would sit and tell us what we call war stories. He'd tell us stories about him and Willie and, and, uh, all kinds of stories about the music business, you know, that they lived through. And he loved to set, he loved an audience. He'd love to tell his stories. And then we'd go in to the room after we socialize a while, we'd go into my office and start working and um a lot of times Waylon would just would just tell me a chunk of of um story about parts of his life and as you know from hearing the album that we basically each song was a chapter in his life and um so he would tell me these things and I would one of us would come up with an idea for a title and then uh then we'd start start writing and uh so um it was just it was just a pure pleasure working with him and uh it, there the stories are kind of countless that uh things that he did but we had a lot of laughter and a lot of uh a lot of work too and Waylon didn't like to work a long time on a song he'd get tired <laughs> We'd have a verse and a chorus, and he'd say, that's all we need, man. And uh, so if I couldn't get him to write some more, I'd go home that night, and I'd write a verse. Then I'd get back with him another day and, and show him the verse, and he'd love it, and we'd keep it. You know? So I had to find ways to work around things that were kind of uh, a nuisance to him. But one last story, when I first met him, he um, he invited us, my wife and I at that time, invited us to his home for 
the holidays for Christmas. And there we were sitting in there at this beautiful home of the his and Jesse's. And around the corner was Tom T. Hall. Another corner around was Chet Atkins. All these people, Connie Smith, just different, you know, legends within their own time. All there. And it, my wife and I were sitting there thinking, what in the world are we doing here? And then as time went on, Jesse fell asleep on the sofa. And so Waylon came over here, over and was was reading cowboy poems that uh, someone had given him, this old book. And he was reading those poems to Kitty and me. And it just seemed so surreal. It just seemed so surreal. But he, he gave me a lot of pleasure in my career, I tell you. He was he was a wonderful man to me. And was to a lot of people. Absolutely. Wow, great stories. Yeah, yeah thank you. There's a couple of songs that I don't think the listeners would forgive me if I didn't ask about. And one of them, it's just an insanely catchy song. I think we can all agree. Don't Rock the Jukebox, which became yeah. the title track yeah. of Alan Jackson's yeah. second album. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I tell you, I have to admit, and I've been admitting this for years, that I first thought that song was what we would call a little ditty, you know, <laughs> but it, I come to find out that it ushered a lot of young people into country music. They just love that song. And, uh, so it, it was, uh, it was stronger than I gave it credit for at first, but we did feel like we had a hit song right off the bat when we got the Rolling Stones and George Jones in the same song. We thought we had something special. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but on the road, another a band member of um, Allen's, I don't know which one rocked the jukebox. I don't know if it was Allen or or uh, or his band member. His name was Roger, too, I think. But uh, one said to the other, don't rock the jukebox, you know. And, and uh, of course, when Allen brought that title to Keith Stegall and me, we, we knew we had something. I mean, it just it just rang like something special. So we really had it to begin with. We, uh, and uh, another thing about that song that I really, really grew to love about Alan Jackson, we had written about, we had written half of it. Basically, we had written more than half of it, but we all, all we lacked was a verse, the second verse. And it was Alan's idea to, to approach it like we did, which was, uh, I ain't got nothing against rock and roll, but when your heart's been broken, you need a song that's slow. He knew he knew enough about his audience in those early days, and he hadn't even, wasn't even on a label yet, but he knew that he wanted to be inclusive on that song. So even to people who consider themselves rock and rollers, he wanted to include them. So that's why he said, I ain't got nothing against rock and roll, because it was all about country, you know. and. Uh, I just thought that inside of Alan said a lot about him early on. I mean, he's 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 just been a very intelligent artist. And that's I think that's one of the reasons he's lasted so long. He's chosen good songs, great production, and uh he just had a um instinct about him about how to please people that he was singing to. And all of the great artists had that. I mean, for instance, Conway Twitty. Conway knew exactly who he was singing to, and he knew what he could do and what he could not do as a, as an artist. And um, it's just just an interesting insight into some of the singers, you know, that they would have that kind of instinct about them. But yeah, Don't Rock a Jukebox has been one of our greatest greatest. Uh, accomplishments, I suppose. I'm really happy to be a part of that. One of the other songs I was going to ask about, you can hear this song, and it's distinct. It's not like every song that you hear on the radio. You hear the first 
couple words and you know that that is Alabama. I'm in a hurry and don't know why. <laughs> what, mm. what inspired <laughs> that one? Well, i tell you what, Randy Van Warmer and I, the late Randy Van Warmer, Randy was the artist and writer on a song years ago called uh, You Left Me Just When I Needed You Most. But we were writing together at the time. Um, and so Randy brought that idea. He had he had it started. And I just immediately knew it was special. And uh, so we sat down and, and finished it out, you know. And uh, it's still kind of amazes me that we use the right kind of speed and stuff on that car because I know nothing about cars. And I had somebody call me to do an interview one time wanting to know if that was my car. And I said, no, uh, I've never had a car that went that fast. But just the way we used that, uh, when we weren't real, neither one of us were very familiar with, with cars. But uh, it just kind of started falling together. I, I remember saying, uh, all I really got to do is live and die. I'm in a hurry and don't know why. And, you know, everyone feels like that song was written for them, you know, because we all feel that way. We all feel like we're rushing around like chickens with our heads cut off sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so it really it really struck a note with people. And one of the things that brings to my mind, another song that Alabama did of ours called High Cotton. And... Uh, one of the most interesting things about that was how children loved that song because of the cadence, the cadence in it, because they obviously didn't know anything about picking cotton. But the way that song, the cadence in that melody, the children just really picked up on it for some reason. You know, it's kind of like a magnet to their ears. <laughs> but it's interesting the things we we hear through the years. I mean, another song that I published i didn't write it i wish i had of but i published uh we're uh it's called um uh, moving on moving on by the uh well can't think of the name of the group right now but uh but what i was going to tell you about it we got emails from people one in particular that he said he was was intending to take his own life and he heard that song and it changed his mind and when you hear something like that, you, you really think about how music affects people. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Rascal Flats is who I was trying to think of, yeah. Uh, they cut that song, and Philip White wrote it with a friend of his. I can't think of his name, but but we published it back in those days. What would you say was the most moving thing someone said to you? Was it that? Well. That would be that would be the number one thing. Of course, that's not my song. But, uh, well, I've read comments like in Facebook and things like that that people write about songs and, and how they affected their lives. And, uh, you know, when we're in the middle of it, we, we just don't think as we should enough about how it affects people. And music brings a lot of hope to people. I mean... If you add up, if you add up the uh, the encouragement and hope and things like that that you your songs effectively take to the world, and it just really really uh, humbles you, and but it also helps you to realize that what you're doing is just not a frivolous thing. It's a it's actually helping society or it can help society and i think it can be negative as well so so it's it, it uh behooves songwriters to do good things with their lyrics and music instead of bad things what was it like for you when you were inducted into the nashville songwriters hall of fame oh it was it was pretty unbelievable I just wasn't expecting that. And then I started looking around, figuratively speaking, at all the people that were in there. And I thought, wow, what am I doing here? You know, 
But enough people, enough professional songwriters felt that way. It, it just makes me uh, extremely grateful and thankful to be considered deserving of it. And I'm just glad to be a part of it, you know, along with my other brothers and sisters in, in the Hall of Fame. There are some incredible writers in there. Oh, yeah. Your name is listed alongside Bobby Braddock, Bob Dylan, <laughs> you could Willie Nelson. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, I'm, just, I'm just very, very thankful. Very thankful. Well, on the note of thankful, what is the best thing about being Roger Murrah? Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Well, you know, I hope that to whatever extent, I hope it's a greater extent rather than a lesser one, that I've just been an influence on for good in society and in my relationships, my friends. And and I know I've encouraged a lot of writers and trained a lot of writers and I enjoy what I've been able to give back and I enjoy being in a position to, um, to whether I deserve it or not is kind of beside the point, but I've been given a position of being an influence and being an encouragement to people as a result of success that I've been um, blessed with. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that. And I, I love helping other people feel a part of that, especially my family. I've told them through the years, whatever happens with me is happening for all of us. Anything that's good about my career, it's because we all, uh, it's, it's for all of us. And I feel that way with everybody I come in contact with. You know, I'm, I'm just grateful to share. Grateful to give back. For all the listeners out there, if you want to check out ColtonENT.com, that's the website for Colton Entertainment Group, which Roger Murrah is, this, that's the home of the Hall of Fame songwriter Roger Murrah. I would just, as we close here, I always like to give the guest the stage. What would you say to anyone who's tuned in? Totally open-ended. Hmm. Wow. Woo. Well, first of all, it's it's humbling to be given the stage because I don't know how deserving I am of it. But I would just like to encourage everybody, if you've got a dream, have the courage to go after it because it won't be brought to your door. They won't call you. You have to go get it. You have to go after it. If it has to do with music business, I'm sure there are listeners out there that have more talent than I had when I began. And of course, there are also those listening who might not be able to be successful in in a uh, an area that they're interested in, but just find an area where you can use your passion and just and just go for it. Just uh, don't let anything get in your way. And um, just be encouraged. We, you know, our life, our lives are bombarded right now with a lot, a lot of terrible things. But you know, there are tremendously positive things that uh, we just don't hear about them like we should. So look at the good things in life and. Don't dwell on the bad. That's all That's all I have to say, I guess. And thank you for listening. My pleasure to do this interview with you. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you very much. Yes, it's been a joy. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you calling me. My pleasure. All right, sir. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Zip, bip. Bibbidi bop boobity zing dang bong chee chee cuddly zing a bang doo coo chee
しいやつきれまつがわいしげかんこんこんどんぐぎずんごらぐれんだがんぽんたいえらずがぱんどんだばでぃぐどぅぐっばい。